Hmm. Interesting. Hello, everyone. Um, <clears throat> I gather the stream is pretty bad. So, um, what's this? What is OBS telling me? Too many video. Um, oh, it's pretty bad. Alright, let me see if I can. Can I. Hmm. Hmm. Uh, okay. All right. I have to trust that um, OBS was complaining, but uh, um, and Twitch is telling me my connection's unstable. But I have to press on. If it's no worse than normal, then um, it will just uh, someone else give me some feedback from Twitch just to check. <coughs> Um, one moment, I'll be right back. Okay. Well, if it's all right. Um, weird. Test. I'm not getting any uh, audio feedback. All right. Sound is fine. Frame rate slow. All right. We we'll just have to live with it. <coughs> okay. So maybe I'll scroll back just a little bit and, and give us a bit of motivation. Um, so what we aim to get to today, amongst other things, is this comparison result, which says that the singular cohomology of the geometric realization of a delta set um, is this way. Yep. This is isomorphic to the delta set cohomology finite dimensional delta sets. Okay. Um, and um, uh, something I was mentioning is about this quotient topology where we can take a, a pair of topological spaces and squash down A, sort of crush A to a point. Um, and then from this um, we get uh, we get a map on relative cohomology because this sort of squashing A to a point business as long as everything is not empty it's a comparison map to you can pull back along Q Q pull back um, between the two relative cohomologies and this is the same as reduced cohomology so this is kind of a little this is this is our aim this is a nice little technical tool that we're going to, to use but we need a condition uh, for it to work <clears throat> there are cases where it really doesn't work um, and so there's this technical condition 
um, and I'm not really going to go through it, but I will. Basically, you want you want A to be closed. Um, this is X, and then A is sitting inside here. We want a slightly larger open. Well, it's got to be a neighborhood. So, like an open set is an example, but it might be. Um, it might be a closed set such that A is in the interior of that closed set or something like that. So that's U. That's just a little bit bigger than A, but which you can deform back onto A without moving everything in A. So that's what this homotopy H does. Oh, fixing everything in A. So. All right, so anyway, so this is kind of just a little recap. So mostly we care about the following. Now we have an example of when this holds, and thankfully because it's kind of the thing we care about. So if X and A is a pair of delta sets, uh, then we know that so A is a sub delta set of X. Then, when you geometrically realize them, it stays a subset. And so, this is a pair, not a subset, it's a subspace, sub topological space. Um, this always satisfies the technical condition. Okay, <clears throat> so this is actually proved in Hatcher. It's you know like it's a <clears throat> it's a really like topological argument. You have to like you have to sit down and grind it out. Doesn't come for free, and it's you know it's like really where sort of the meat of these proofs are, where you have to like. Go down to actual topology and, and argue um, with complicated stuff. So, in particular, oh, excellent! My bit rays improved. So, in particular, um, let's suppose X is n dimensional an n dimensional delta set then we can take x and it's n minus 1 skeleton um has the frame rate picked up um js and luke and tommy and everyone Um, so then we can apply geometric realization and get uh, a pair like this. So just just as a reminder, this is the same thing as like the n minus one stage of the geometric realization. So I've just stopped one stage before the end. Um, <clears throat> then there's a map of pairs which crushes down this uh, sort of topological skeleton if you like um, down so now why is this interesting and it has a, a canonical base point this is interesting because we can't do this operation in delta sets uh, we can't take a sub delta set and squash like it consists of a bunch of simplices and except in degenerate situations we can't 
squash all those simplices down to like single points. Once we geometrically realize, then we can. Um, okay, so if we call this Q, so it's really a function from <clears throat> from the geometric realization of X down to this, this quotient space, and we know that everything in this subspace gets mapped down to this base point. And so here's a fact which I'm, I'm not going to um, prove it, but it's it's doable with the tools in this course. So we can say, what does this quotient look like? We stop and think, what is it? What is it doing? So we have an actual space built out of triangles, tetrahedra, and so on. Um, let's say, let's say, uh, <coughs> n is three. <coughs> so it's built out of points, lines, tetrahedra, triangles, and tetrahedra, all glued together. The n minus one skeleton is just the sort of the tr up to triangles, and what we're doing is taking everything that's not like a solid tetrahedron and collapsing it to a point. And so in particular, the boundary of every tetrahedron is collapsed to a point. Um, and that's like taking a, a disc in R3, so like a three-dimensional solid ball, collapsing all the boundary to a point, which is a sphere. But somehow we're doing this, not just sort of tetrahedron by tetrahedron, but also how they're glued together. But everything that's like lower than a tetrahedron is smashed to a point. But all this stuff actually still works. So we get a bunch of spheres that are somehow glommed together. Um, so using the definition of all these things as pushouts, then this is homeomorphic to, uh, let's say, I'll write it like this, xn, so xn has the discrete topology. So remember that like x, the geometric realization of x, because it's n-dimensional, has a map from this, um, from this space here, and it maps onto geometric realization of x, and it's somehow a quotient map, which actually glues all the, the tetrahedra, or higher simplices together and collapsing uh, like mapping down to geometric realization of X and then quotienting out extra stuff you can actually like, sort of unpack this and it turns out to be the same thing as crushing down the boundary so this thing here is like the image the union of the images of the um, xn times delta n minus 1 partial i to xn times delta n. So this is the horizontal top map in the definition of the pushout. Because what we're doing is crushing everything. So this bit here is like the bottom left corner of the pushout. Um, and so this is kind of a bit of a sleight of hand but <coughs> but otherwise you know some universal property and so on that means you get a homeomorphism here and if that is kind of a bit too fast just sort of believe it as somehow being a reasonable thing you can do because this here is like uh, yeah this is the geometric realization of the n minus one skeleton of this thing so everything's nicely compatible anyway so this okay so that's that's a slightly tricky isomorphism to see and then there's uh what we can do is we could squash down the boundary first uh just like the boundary bit here but not the xn's and then squash down the xn's so this is homeomorphic to delta n mod sort of squashing the boundary and then you sort of keep, remember that you squashed it here so it's sort of boundary with the boundary squashed so that's a single point space so in fact this bit here is as a topological space or it's homeomorphic to that which is discrete 
Um, <clears throat> but we know also that the N simplex with all its boundary squashed is like taking a ball and squashing the boundary which is uh, the same thing as the N sphere after homeomorphism so this whole thing is Xn times an N sphere squashing um, oh it's Xn times star inside Sn so this star is the sort of canonical base point you get in the N sphere from defining it as like a simplex where you've crushed the boundary and the image of the boundary is this point star um, and what does this look like? I'm going to draw a little cartoon so I have, if I have in the this is like my XN direction this is my SN direction then I have like Xn has got the discrete topology um, and I have my N spheres and they have, they're defined in such a way they have a canonical base point namely is the image of the boundary of the N simplex so I'll just get rid of that last one just pretend I didn't have that <clears throat> so it's, it's Xn which is discrete times the N sphere which is like the disjoint union of Xn many copies of the N sphere <laughs> Um, but then I'm, I'm identifying. I should put maybe even more contrasting. But this, this bit here is the same as these points here, and I'm identifying all those uh, down to a single point. So this maps down to. So it's like. The wedge sum except now i've got arbitrary indexing set and i've just drawn it where it's small here so this is sort of the arbitrary wedge sum of sn's indexed by sn by xn uh, so it turns out here that like all the SNs are the same, but you, you don't need them all the same. As an abstract operation, you take just a, an arbitrary family of pointed spaces, so they each have a, a single point selected in them, and you identify all the base points, and they glue together. Okay, any questions about this? Because this is a, this is a little sleight of hand, especially that top um, homeomorphism there. Hopefully people feel comfortable that this is at least something you believe is possible. I need like a, a grooving cat gif in the top corner <coughs> while I'm waiting for questions. <sighs> <clears throat> okay so why do I care about this well it does tell me um, well I gotta think about my technical condition right so my technical condition says that under certain circumstances I can um, identify. Did I say that? Uh, yeah. So I think I mentioned it in my little preamble, but let me say it again. Technical condition. On a pair of spaces. X A implies that the reduced cohomology of x mod a <coughs> uh, is isomorphic by a specified map to the singular the relative cohomology 
of x and a. And moreover, um, uh, the the n sphere and a base point satisfies this condition because um, you can take a little disk or a little neighborhood, a little open sort of disk around the sort of the north pole of the sphere, um, and it's contractible back onto the point. So. And you can do this for an, a disjoint union of arbitrary many spheres. Um, so but more generally, I want to say given a uh, reasonable, probably something like locally contractible, um, but let's not go there, uh, a reasonable topological spaces. Um, Uh, but, 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 but y alpha, alpha in i, and a base point in each of them. Oh, we almost had a question in Discord. Okay. Um, so, e.g., y alpha equals s n. Then, um. We can take the pair consisting of the disjoint union of the y alphas and the subspace consisting of the disjoint union of the little y alphas. Um, this satisfies the, con the technical condition. And so, um, we get this nice little result is that the reduced singular cohomology of this um, arbitrary wedge sum of the y's is, well, by the condition, it's the same as the uh, singular cohomology of the relative singular cohomology. this one but then um, because the distant union pulls out through the the uh, the cohomology this is the direct product of all the individual relative cohomologies this is like uh, alpha in I And then, uh, well, then we can play the same trick in reverse. The spaces y are reasonable. And this becomes the relative, sorry, the reduced cohomology of the y alphas. So, in particular, all right, let's apply this to the the, the big wedge sum of spheres that we had. Um, Reduced cohomology of the giant wedge sum indexed by xn. Uh, that's an n. That's a singular. It's isomorphic to the product indexed by xn of the singular cohomology of a single sphere, which we happen to have calculated. So it's product of xn many copies of r, k is n, and 0 otherwise. <clears throat> so, there's some background chatter. Maybe I should ignore, but let's have a look. Um, yeah, okay, that's good to know, yes. Uh, don't lag on me, computer. 
Oh wow. Okay. And I will also point out that this product is isomorphic to R, the functions from Xn to R, at which point your like suspicion antennas should start uh, twitching because <coughs> where did we get this giant wedge sum of spheres from in the first place? Let's go scroll up, scroll up, scroll up, scroll up. Hang on a minute. We got it from the geometric realization of our delta set. Ah, uh, but now it's like relative. You could take relative singular cohomology of a pair of spaces, and it starts to look like the sort of thing you get when you're constructing delta set cohomology. And these things are vastly different in size because delta set cohomology is like combinatorial and if your delta set is finite it's got a finitely generated module uh, but the singular cohomology is absolutely enormous a priori though until you prove that it's it's not so big um, so this should start you uh, thinking that something magical is about to happen <clears throat> so we're going to recall so we're going to keep this calculation up our sleeve so I mean in particular what does this tell us this tells us that uh, since um, x mod geometric, geometric realization of x mod the skeleton is this big wedge sum and the geome the pair consisting of the geometric realization of x and its n minus one skeleton this satisfies our technical condition this is telling us something about this relative cohomology So, interesting. So we somehow have to make all these facts glob them together. So I want you to recall this comparison map uh, of delta sets. Um, it sends a delta set to the singular Cochain, uh, well, singular delta set of the geometric realization. I'll just see my my levels. Um, <clears throat> I had notation for this. I sent an x. So this sits inside x n. It maps it to a specific, um, a specific sort of like topological singular simplex inside the geometric realization. So now we apply the the cochain complex functor. So that goes the other way. Uh, let's see x r. Uh, then we get singular cochain complex or the geometric realization and what this does sorry uh, a thing in here is a function on um, singular simplices and what we do is you restrict that function to only look at the ones of of the special form sort of like x hat so this function with some enormous like uncountably infinite dimensional domain well uh, not infinite dimensional like it's the domain is a set some giant uncountable set and when then we restrict that to a very special subset just coming from the 
the things coming from X itself, like X in itself. Um, and then we get a comparison map, it's just to sort of recap where this all comes from, on cohomology. You apply the cohomology functor, and so now the left hand side is delta set cohomology, and on the right is singular cohomology. Again, it's it's gotten by restricting to only special um, simplices. And everything is compatible. Everything is compatible with morphisms. So if I had a like a uh, like a commuting square of delta sets, I'd get a commuting square of maps of cochain complexes. Uh, and even better than that. <coughs> If I think about the pair consisting of x and its n minus one skeleton, then it gives us even better a comparison map between short exact sequences of cochain complexes. Okay, so we get this. So basically it's taking this uh, comparison map of cochain complexes but doing it in several goes at once and so we have zero I might drop R everywhere just uh, it's, it's along for the ride, it's just turned invisible okay so Relative singular cochain complex. Right, and that was defined to be the kernel of the map I'm about to write down, which is this one uh, singular cochain complex of the geometric realization of the n minus 1 skeleton of x. So that row is exact, and I get these comparison maps. So here I should have just the relative cochain complex where I'm doing the delta set version. That's equal, that's equal, and I have these restriction maps and everything commutes and the rows are exact okay so we saw something like this before where it, I said, well, suppose I had a map of short exact sequences of cochain complexes, so everything is compatible here. Then I get long exact sequences of modules, uh, and then vertical maps between everything, and everything commutes. <coughs> so now I'll get a diagram uh, of R modules. With exact rows, so see how well I can do fitting this in. Uh, okay, K minus one singular okay, then this wraps around uh, connecting homomorphism upper dimension are now uh, going to cohomology of the geometric realization of x oh no that's not it, it should be the relative one my fault uh, s k n minus 1 x then then x then hk singular of again the n minus 1 skeleton 
and so on. Okay, so that's the singular one, and I also get one for the delta set, so it's a slightly easier to write. Again, this is the comparison map that I wrote down before, but now I've just got them vertical. So HK delta set relative cohomology delta set cohomology delta set cohomology so all the squares commute and the rows are long exact sequences okay Phew. now the thing um, <clears throat> the bottom row <coughs> is ideally easier to calculate I mean it's combinatorial like you've done examples where you just do it by hand with matrices it's um, you could code it into a computer and the computer could calculate it for you uh, the top row is well that's a lot harder so and uh, ideally you want to do things like I'd like to calculate a cohomology of a singular cohomology of a space but that's hard so if I can set it up such that I get this diagram maybe I can calculate it using the bottom row somehow all right so I'm going to mark this with a star so we actually calculated the top one here right <clears throat> So we had, let's assume x is n-dimensional, uh, we actually calculated the, the singular cohomology, singular, relative singular cohomology here. Um, throw the r back in for definiteness. Um, this is uh, x n and zero. Um, and and here's a here's a calculation which is not very long. Hold on a minute. Magic is probably going to happen. So the domain and the codomain of this map that I put a star on are basically the same. But I want to know, like, what is this star map actually doing? <coughs> it's not enough to know that these things are abstractly isomorphic. I want that map, which is constructed in a very specific way, to be an isomorphism. Um, and you can we can prove with techniques from this course we could also have shown um, star is xn fold product direct product of maps what is it? Um, <clears throat> uh, da, 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 da. How do I want to write this? Sn uh, one copy uh, Hn relative cohomology. So now this thing on the the codomain here is super explicit and we know exactly what this is doing this uh, singular cohomology is a little bit more complicated um, but so this is R and well actually it's it's K but when K is not R if, sorry, if k is not n, it's 0 to 0, which is an isomorphism. And when k equals n, 
if we get a map from R to R, and there's an explicit calculation you can do that checks this is an isomorphism. So, so it's not enough that the domain equals the codomain. Because right, there are lots of maps from like Rn to Rn which are not isomorphisms. <coughs> Maybe you just say Rn to Rn. There are lots of maps from Z to Z. Or linear, like, you know, homomorphisms from Z to Z which are not isomorphisms. In fact, only two maps out of the infinitely many are isomorphisms. Okay. So thus, so star is an iso always. So x being n-dimensional. Okay, cool. Hope everyone's with me. Small stretchy break. Uh, warm ourselves up. We're on the home stretch. Hand to the theorem. Let me uh, see if I can zoom out to give everyone a more bird's eye view. There we go. And this is a long exact sequence. As these keep going, they wrap around. Like there's another map here, which is star. And that's important. Um, yeah. Yeah, maybe write that one in. Singular H K X and then it keeps going. Uh, the wedge sum um, the wedge sum space kit is if you have um, topological spaces with chosen points in each one, then you can consider all those points the union of those sitting inside the disjoint sum of all your spaces and then you could crush all those those base points to be identified to a single point <clears throat> and so either you can do this with like a pair of spaces and they both have like a little base point and you sort of glue them together and we we did this earlier but in fact you can have an arbitrary family of them And they don't all have to be the same, but in the, the little application we had here, all the spaces turned out to be isomorphic to a sphere, in the same dimension, um, and they all had the same base point. So we just, you know, for for like a one sphere, this is like a bouquet of circles. It's the phrase that people sometimes use. All right. So, all right. Let's have a look at our big diagram again. I'm gonna try to. So these maps here, to make them nice and thick, are isomorphisms. Now, let's stare at it for a bit. And we have two parameters here. We have K and N. And we're in this special situation where we have, well, we had some quasi-isomorphisms. So we get isomorphisms in cohomology. And then we get some, it's like that's every third map. And then in between those, we've got some maps and the sort of broken into a pair of two different families that alternate. So we have the following situation. I'm not going to draw the, the objects here. Um, so single star, and that's an isomorphism. And then we have uh, Funky star, and then we have a double star, asterisk, I should say, and then an isomorphism, single star, 
so on. Now count these maps. <coughs> There's five of them. And if only there was a lemma we could use that dealt with five maps in such an arrangement. And luckily, so if we assume these sort of double star oval maps we can apply the five lemma okay right, but what are these double star maps these are maps involving n minus 1 skeleton of x. So that's an n minus 1 dimensional delta set. So it's one dimension down. And moreover, uh, yeah, so we could apply the 5 lemma and like this pattern repeats, sort of ad infinitum. So assuming double star maps are isomorphisms, we can inductively get sort of fancy star maps are isomorphisms and then we can do it so that's like induction on K and then induction on N to prove it to prove uh, sort of this is an ISO for arbitrary finite dimensional delta sets. So there's some weird double induction going on. Okay, so this Aside from quite technical um, things that I didn't prove to you, but uh, there are ways to look these up, um, this gives us the singular cohomology of its geometric realization and have a specified comparison map is an isomorphism. For OK. All right. <clears throat> so I stated this theorem a little while ago, but now you've seen like the amount of work that goes into actually proving it, um, which is not insubstantial. Um, lots of I hit all the, uh, the gory details that really delves into the topology um, and the you have to get down to like brass tacks with specific examples that you have to calculate just you know from from the definition and I'm happy to handball that to to Hatcher um, <clears throat> so that's so I was thinking I was gonna call this I can't remember if I wrote down a one but this is equation two in my notes. Um, so this, I should note, this is sometimes true. For arbitrary delta sets, so infinite dimensional ones. But it starts to get a little bit more fiddly, so So you take a prime field, for instance, as your ring. Um, um, so we know that delta set cohomology can be calculated using like a large dimensional skeleton, like the tenth cohomology module can be calculated using like the twelfth skeleton or something like this, because it's high up enough that the high dimensional stuff doesn't matter. But for a topological space, um, even though every uh, 
like every continuous function from a topological simplex it factors through some uh, like truncated thing. which is the same as this sitting inside x, the geometric realization of x, it could be a different n as you change your, your simplex. So there's not some uniform procedure. Um, and sometimes there's like a correction term that happens. We're not going to go into it in this course. So something like <clears throat> a finite delta set, we're fine. Like if if you know that, yeah. So if you know about compactness, then a finite delta set, the geometric realization is compact. So you're in a nice situation. Um, that's sort of note one. Note two. <laughs> It's worth noting that uh, the, the right-hand side of two of this, uh, it's only functorial for delta set maps, but singular cohomology is functorial for arbitrary continuous maps. So um, there's sort of more flexibility on the left hand side than on the right hand side. So if I was given a geometric realization of a delta set and then another one and a continuous map between them, it does something reasonable to the singular cohomology, but I can't tell you what it does on the right hand side. So, I mean, maps that arise from geometric realization of maps of delta sets, so that's okay, but that's because it's they're super rigid maps. Whew. So, just going to mention a couple of corollaries of this, and in the last uh, lecture, we're going to do a, a nice application of cohomology. Any questions at this point? Because uh, we'll have a small break in between the two oh, this is pretty epic <clears throat> so sort of observations suggestions Let's say we take two delta sets x and y, um, finite dimensional, and um, if If x is homeomorphic to y, oh, what I said about one. Okay, Razor. Um, <clears throat> thank you. So when you calculate the cohomology of delta set, even if it's infinite dimensional, it can be calculated as the cohomology of, like, one of the skeletons. We take like some high dimensional but still finite dimensional skeleton of it and as long as your cohomology is somehow like in dimension lower down than the dimension of what the skeleton is you get the same cohomology but for topological spaces if your space arises from a delta set a geometric realization um, then 
like every topological simplex mapping in via some sigma does land inside some sort of sort of finite dimensional bit and so you say what's the what's the element of cohomology well it's a map out of it's a function on the the, the simplices but you can't just pick an n restrict to that n dimensional skeleton and then not necessarily um, you can't necessarily say oh, it's okay to only evaluate my function on things that are inside this n skeleton for a large enough n. Um, <clears throat> there's sometimes some things which which uh, mean that this sort of na naive idea doesn't quite work. If you want to there's a thing called a a limb one functor which turns up um, it's like a correction term uh, yeah so like the thing you get just by considering like sort of a truncated uh, well you could consider all the possible truncations to n dimensions and somehow try to glue them all together how like they become modules and you stick them all together somehow that might still not be enough. There might be some things which arise because of infinite dimensional phenomena. But apparently, if you take your ring to be a prime field, then uh, there's there's not an issue. So there's algebraic stuff that's going on that's deeper than just um, yeah, the sort of combinatorial stuff that's happening for delta sets. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I haven't dug through what's going on there enough, um, so I don't want to. I I sort of yeah. I I I, I sort of my first version of this was I had I was just double checking my notes and it's like oh, I don't quite agree with what I wrote, so I'm gonna not really say anything concrete here. I'll just say it sometimes works and sometimes is a bit more complicated. Okay. Blah, 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 blah. Okay. So if I have X and Y have homeomorphic geometric realizations, I hope that answers your question, Razor. Um, I'm just conscious of having a little break before the last lecture. Um, we can thresh out details later if you want. Um, then the cohomology of x as a delta set which is the same as the singular cohomology of the geometric realization but because I have homeomorphic spaces I have isomorphic cohomology modules this is the same as the cohomology of the geometric realization of y which is the same as the delta set cohomology of y um, Right, and now there may be no maps between X and Y as delta sets. Alright, so just because how rigid they are, we might not be able to compare them via, you know, like this, this composite uh, all the way from here to here may not come from a map of delta sets uh, which is you go okay that's 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 kind of cool um, and we could even maybe there was a homotopy equivalence All right, so that's sort of even an even stronger result is that if I have a pair of delta sets, their geometric realizations are homotopy equivalent, the delta set cohomologies are the same. So 
I just want to I, I should make a quick definition here so like given topological space y triangulation is a choice of delta set let's say x and a homeomorphism between the geometric realization of x and y <clears throat> and so if we have a triangulation of a space we can calculate its cohomology via delta set cohomology triangulation of a space uh, let's say a finite dimensional triangulation of a space calculate cohomology using delta set cohomology so we're thinking about going around the other way where now we say I would like to know the cohomology of the space so I'll find a delta set um, <clears throat> and different triangulations and this is follows from this corollary we get isomorphic So, yeah, right. So, if I had x1, x2 with a specified homeomorphism to y from each of them, then their cohomologies are the same. So, the choice, the, the calculation of the cohomology from the triangulation is independent of the choice of triangulation. This is a big deal. Okay, so, e.g., let's triangulate a sphere any old how. We get a, say, a finite delta set. assume it's a finite triangulation we're going to get Euler characteristic is too because it doesn't matter like the Euler characteristic comes from the, the the delta set or from the cohomology of the delta set and if that's the same no matter what triangulation of the sphere you pick then you're always going to get the same Euler characteristic so the Euler characteristic of any polyhedron in the kind of traditional Euler sense is always two. So let's have a small break and you can all just bask in the majesty of that 23 lecture proof of Euler's theorem. <coughs> Even modulo details. Uh, Let's have a five minute break and then uh, grab a drink, get up and stretch, <coughs> have a chat. <sighs> Just because I got one lecture left, we can uh, look at some other stuff. 
Discord wake up. Yeah, Razor, it's uh, it's uh, it's fun stuff. So, okay. Ugh, just mute my thing. No, Razor, um, unfortunately not, but um, <clears throat> we're not going to be looking at how changing the ring uh, changes things, but uh, the process is functorial because you can always get, um, you know, let's think about a uh, uh, delta set given this, and a map of rings like R to S, then you can post compose everything and get a map to here. Oh yeah, the rings are commutative um, by assumption. Um, well, we haven't really used the ring structure, um, but uh, if you had non-commutative rings, everything we've done so far works because we haven't used the multiplication in the ring yet. So, yeah, so for instance, you can do things like take R is Z, S equals like Z mod P. It's called reduction modulo P. So uh, one is a field. Oh, yeah, Z is not a field, but Z mod P is a field. Um, and so you get nice maps from groups into vector spaces a billion groups to vector spaces um, or you could do like Z to R as in like the reals okay this is bad notation but S equals the reals um, <clears throat> and yeah so then you get like cohomology with real values is a is a vector space and then the image of 
the map from the integer valid cohomology is like a lattice inside the real vector space but the kernel is all the torsion stuff so yeah people do study this but there's only so much you can do in a course but hopefully you feel more confident um, about tackling the tackling all these little extra bits okay so let's roll on who's ready for a little fun uh, fun lecture An application to group theory um, what's to do with CW complexes all our geometric realization of uh, delta sets are CW complexes but they are defined in a more flexible way where you're like you don't use the combinatorics uh, so you can define a multiplication on the graded ring that's the direct sum of all the cohomologies and I'm thinking we'll have a look at that tomorrow um, yeah so CW complexes are like glomming together balls but the 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 pushouts are less rigid um, they, they could be um, more general okay so we're going to fix a group uh, G it could be non-abelian uh, and an abelian group and um, when they talk about rings and non-commutative things you'll notice that if you look at cohomology, things kind of make sense if you don't have a ring but just have an abelian group, at least the things we've done so far. So we're going to do some fun stuff. Um, so there will be more details of what I'm about to cover in the notes, um, but I'm just going to summarize because it's just an application. Um, <coughs> it's like last lecture. Let's just uh, do something fun. So central extension of G by A is, so we have a sequence like so, so I injective pi surjective um, image of I equals kernel of pi, so it's like a short exact sequence but now G and G hat can be non-abelian and I demand that A is inside the center of G. Uh, so A is not just abelian, but it, the, the things in the image of A inside G hat commute with everything in G hat. Um, okay, so, so here's an example. Uh, let's take A be plus or minus, no not plus or minus one, um, Z mod 2. I'm going to have A written additive, additively and G is going to be written multiplicatively. And G hat multiplicative as well, but uh, you'll see how it works, it's not, not a problem. Uh, we take A Let's take G hat to be the group, which is um, plus or minus basis quaternions uh, under multiplication. So someone's called Q8. And then G is going to be product of cyclic groups like this. And I takes an element of, um, of Z mod 2. This is additive and sends it to minus one to the power of that thing um, <clears throat> and uh, yeah and then G is like G hat mod mod this I A so you can check um, that this works so yeah, you should really think of I as somehow like being A is additive and I is something like an exponential which turns it into multiplicative stuff in G hat 
and then G is kind of the quotient. But let's say we give it A and G and we somehow build up G hat. All right, so here's a question. So this is a problem in group theory, especially in like finite groups where they go, oh no, like <clears throat> how do I make a new group? It's finite. Um, and uh, or G is a finite simple group and A is something like Z mod 2 and there are some interesting other finite groups sitting inside or G hat sits inside some other interesting finite simple groups or something. And I kind of try to figure out how all the pieces fit together. But this works for arbitrary groups. So we can use cohomology of a certain delta set. Okay, that's my claim. So we're going to define, all right, we've got blackboard bold B G. So dimension zero, we have just a single thing. And then in higher dimensions, it's the n fold product of G. So in particular, it's infinite dimensional. Um, <clears throat> where, so it's got face maps, di of one of these things looks like, all right, we have some options. We could we drop the first thing or we could drop the last thing uh, in minus one. Uh, and between, what do we do? Well, we multiply the ith and the i plus first element. Okay. So you can check this forms a delta set. Um, this is one that I've thought about many a time. I mean, I, yeah, I've even published work looking at generalizations of things like this. Um, so we can do cohomology coefficients in A. Or if you want to be really super strict, you could do something like you know, the group ring of A. But we could just work directly uh, with A. Um, so what does this, oops, that's a G. I'm going to try to get a feel for this. So it's infinite dimensional, so arbitrary cohomology is kind of, well, I don't know, what does it do? I mean, I, I know what it does, but um, let's get a feel for low dimensions. So we've got to write down what is the, the delta map. So let's say F goes to A, and so this is like G to the N. I'm not happy with this. Clean, clean, clear. Try again. Right. Now both sides here are groups, this is just a function to start with. And then uh, g1 up to gn plus 1, what is it, well it's the first one which throws away the first element and evaluates, and then a sum is a minus one to the i. So the Adelaide students may have seen something like this before in a different course. Minus one to the n. Now we throw away, whoops, there should be an n plus one here. Oops, no, don't try that. Gn 
Okay. Um, <clears throat> all right. So that's that's what the 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 geometry map looks like. So let's look in low dimensions. Dimension zero. Uh, well, dimension zero is simply an element of A. Um, but when we look at delta zero of A evaluated at G, it's A minus A, which is zero. So delta zero equals the zero map. So in particular, um, the zeroth cohomology of B, G coefficients in A uh, is isomorphic to kernel of delta naught which is A. All right, and that's true for arbitrary G. So that's that's kind of mildly interesting, maybe, or well, maybe not. It's connected in some sense because there's only a single zero simplex. Um, okay, dimension one. What do we have? So let's take phi from right, again. I'm only assuming it's a function. Um, so let's look at delta one phi, uh, evaluated at g. Uh, slightly different notation notes, whatever. So it's phi of h minus phi of g h plus phi of g. And let's say that's equal to zero. What do we get? Well, we certainly get phi of gh equals phi of g plus phi of h. Hello. That's kind of nice. And there's a double check you can do. So phi of one equals zero, and also uh, zero, which is phi of one, phi of g g inverse. Okay. So phi of g inverse is minus phi of g. Thus, right, h1, remember um, delta 0 is the 0 map, so this is the same as kernel of delta 1, or kernel of delta 0, but that's nothing, that's equal to 0. And so things in the kernel of delta 1 are precisely the homomorphisms, so it's like the homomorphisms from G to A. Am I right? Hom G to A. Okay. This is quite nice. I'm not seeing anything near to what my problem is, but I'm sort of doing some nice calculations. Let's look at dimension two. All right, now it starts to get fun. <coughs> Let's see what these things look like. Uh, and then see if we can use them. So foreshadowing, we can use them. Um, so let's consider a function g. So this is in uh, 2 of b, g, a. Um, what's delta 2 of alpha? Um, okay. G2, G3. Oh man, this stuff I'm going to do in my sleep. So, uh, anyways. Happy memories. That's alpha G1, G2, G3. Minus alpha G1, G2. Right, I love this cohomology is just fantastic stuff. It would be too strong to say I love cohomology, but I think it's pretty neat. 
Um, <coughs> so delta two alpha equals zero means this complicated thing on the right hand side is zero. Um, so we call it alpha is a two co cycle. And so you can check manually that like delta two of delta one of phi is zero. I mean, you kind of expect it to happen, but sort of seeing the how it all cancels out is nice. Um, <clears throat> how do we find such a thing? So, I mean, you get one of these, right? Take a homomorphism phi from g to a and get uh, 5 g minus 5 g h plus 5 h is a two coat cycle. Uh, no, sorry, not a homomorphism. I mean, a function. That would be zero. Take an arbitrary function. Okay. Um, so, let me go back. Let me say I've got a central extension. Oh, by absolute fortune, I happen to be wearing exactly the right shirt for this lecture, and I shall tell you why. Let's see if I can get it on screen. Ah. Okay, I will tell you why later. <coughs> I did not plan this, but it's awesome. Um, so pi is onto, i is injective. Take a central extension uh, and a far and a section, right? A function s from g to g hat with pi compose s the identity on g. So it's a section of pi. Um, now let us define alpha twiddle uh, g h to be s g s h s g h inverse. So this kind of looks formally like the phi, um, except I'm not having I don't have a function to a, so but it's kind of in the same ballpark. And I can notice that pi of alpha twiddle of gh, so alpha twiddle, I should say, is a function from g squared to g hat. But pi of this, pi is a homomorphism. Pi is a homomorphism. And so you can split it up like so. Uh, but it's a section, so it's g times h times gh inverse, which is 1. And so alpha twiddle of gh is in the image of i. So you can now define uh, alpha from g squared to a by I compose alpha twiddle equals alpha, and this is unique. All right, and it's a nice exercise. Delta two alpha is indeed equal to zero. So alpha is a two co cycle. All right, so at this point you should stop and think alright I took a delta set made from a group and then I took something that's purely group theoretic and I got a, a representative of a cohomology class on a delta set 
that's kind of cool, right? Because everything we're doing in Delta sets, we're saying, oh, it's about topology and, and all this. And now we're getting the things in topology from something in group theory. So what does this do? And this works for arbitrary central extensions given fixed G and A. So we get an assignment. Let's say you have a central extension of G by A uh, equipped with a section right, that data is important for the time being to C2 BG A okay now here's a question I had to pick a section what if I picked a different section Hmm, interesting. Um, what do I do? So, S prime from G to G hat with pi compose S prime U identity on G, we get a new alpha prime G squared to A. All right, um, how does this relate to our other thing? Well, let's compare our sections. So let's define phi twiddle of g. Right now we have two sections. We can compare their values, like uh, like measure their difference, if you like, in the group by this map phi. Um, and this happens to be inside the kernel of pi, because s and s prime are both sections of pi. So we get a phi from G to A by phi composed I is equal to phi twiddle. <clears throat> okay. Now hang on a minute. I've got a function from G to A. I can make a co-cycle out of it. Even better, um, I mean, that's one thing I could do. I could also just now though I, I have a formula for s in terms of phi and well phi twiddle right, let's make it phi i phi g times s prime g and so I could substitute this into the definition of alpha i alpha g h which is the same as s g s h s g h inverse um, <clears throat> now I can use my little formula here and recall let's see where are we up to okay yeah I'll keep going um, i phi g s prime g uh, I phi H S prime H now the thing to remember is everything in the image of I is in the center of G hat so it commutes with everything in G hat so I have I phi G H S prime G H the inverse yeah, I can do inverse here. But let's uh <coughs> yep, 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 yep. Okay. But image of I is inside the center of G hat. So I can just permute it past everything else. So I have I phi of G I and I'll pull the inverse through here. I phi of H I uh, let's see pa, 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 pa. and I write the inverse additively inside A so I'll write it like this and then I have S prime G 
S prime H, S prime G H inverse. Well, this bit is just alpha I alpha prime of G H. Now I use the fact that I is a homomorphism. This is I am additively written in A, and then hello, phi G H plus phi of H per I alpha prime G H. In fact, this is I delta one of phi G H plus alpha prime g h h in there awesome and i is injective <coughs> means alpha g h is equal to well it's alpha prime g h plus something in the image of delta one but i don't even need these g h's blah 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 scrub 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 Okay, um, that's pretty wild. So what this means is that if I change my section, all I do is change my representative for my cohomology class. We have an assignment, right, so before, let me scroll down, uh, zoom, zoom, zoom. This assignment at the top, it's central extension equipped with a section and I get uh, something in the cochain complex. And if I'm willing to pass to cohomology, then I, uh, I'm not changing my cohomology class. Okay, that's kind of cool. So, <clears throat> let's see. What can we say about this thing? Um, <clears throat> I mean, uh, on uh, on the face of it, how many central extensions are there? I mean, depending on your foundations of mathematics, you know, like, is there a proper class? You know, is there a proper class of one element sets? You know, uh, we could have things that are like should be regarded as the same but uh, sort of just happen to be written in different notation so in fact we want to look at maybe equivalence classes of central extensions um, uh, let's just note this is independent of choice of section so it's intrinsic to the extension um, <clears throat> so I'm going to define two central extensions so the thing is just asking that like g hat 1 and g hat 2 are isomorphic is not enough they're isomorphic groups but they could not quite sit together right um, regarding all the other data uh, of G by A to be isomorphic if there is um, what did I call it? Let's call it beta isomorphism such that um, G hat two. They both sit inside a central extension sequence, but I want all these triangle, these two triangles, to commute. So A sits inside these isomorphic groups, sort of in a compatible way with the isomorphism, and then we take the quotient groups, you get the same thing back again. Um, 
and if I have uh, uh, sections S1 and S2 of pi 1 and pi 2, I then construct the co-cycle from the section They lie in the same uh, cohomology class. And so this assignment even goes even goes better. It, it sort of descends central extensions of G by A up to isomorphism and I have a well-defined map to the second cohomology of BG with coefficients in A um, and here's a theorem This function is an isomorphism. And even an isomorphism of, of groups. I haven't said what the uh, group structure is on the um, central extensions, but um, There is one that you can construct. I take a pair of central extensions and make a new central extension out of them. Sometimes it's called the central product. <coughs> um, so the bit, right, so at, at the moment all we've got is a map. Um, possibly we've shown it's injective. I'm not entirely sure. Uh, no, we haven't. We haven't shown anything about this map. All we've done is show that there is a well-defined map here, and the theorem is that this map is an isomorphism. So at the moment, it's it's kind of like a map of sets because I haven't put any structure on the left-hand side. The right-hand side is a group um, where you add co-cycles point-wise. Um, so, part of the proof is given a, uh, a co-cycle, well, an element to co-cycle, you want to construct a central extension. Uh, a goes to G hat goes to G um, and then here's the awesome bit the fact that delta 2 alpha equals 0 is precisely the thing that gives you that the multiplication function you cook up is associative um, so let me say that again G has an, oh, this is like cooked out of alpha, has an associative product, the same thing as saying delta 2 alpha equals 0. Um, oh, this is just, just, just lovely. Um, <clears throat> I think that's pretty cool. Um, and then you have to say, well, given that I have that central extension, I have to cook up a co-cycle from it, and uh, you find that you get back the same cohomology class. 
um, and vice versa. Well, if you have two central extensions whose uh, co-cycles lie in the same cohomology class, you have to prove that those two extensions are isomorphic. And you can construct the isomorphic. Everything here is like you just construct it. There's no, um, I mean, choosing a section is, is, is not a construction, but um, all the sort of algebraic stuff, you just write down formulas and build it, and it's just wonderful. Yeah, so maybe I should uh, give you the definition of what G hat alpha is. So it's um, A times G as a set, which is kind of sensible for like cardinality reasons, at least in the finite world. And then what does it mean to multiply two things? So you have A of 1, a G1, you want to sort of define a product somehow involving alpha. And a to G2, well, it's defined to be A1 plus A2 plus alpha G1 G2 um, G1 G2. And you can check that, <coughs> you want to check this is associative, uh, it's precisely the co cycle delta 2 alpha equals 0 implies this is associative. Um, you got to got to prove that it's uh, is you know has a unit and has inverses and stuff but this is a uh, this all follows. So that's sort of half the proof. The other half of the proof is given two central extensions um, a G hat to G, A, G hat 2 to G, such that like alpha 1 is in the same cohomology class as alpha 2, you cook up an isomorphism uh, compatible with of extensions. So it's compatible with the i's and the pi's and stuff. That's a 1 by 2. Alright. Well, I am at this point just improvising. Any questions? I mean, technically we've got 10 minutes left. Um, I mean, I could give you like, what's the definition of the raw definition of the product that we use on the? Maybe that's a bit ambitious in the last ten minutes, but uh, sort of, I'd say, ask me anything, but it's a little bit too open for a. Uh... Oh, that's right. Sorry, I was going to tell you what my my T-shirt has to do with what it has to do with this. Um, okay, so I see if I can find the picture. Let's wait up. Um, all right, go away, go away, you. Slight lag, slight lag. Okay, what do I want? I want, um, uh, I want this thing. Let's see, can it find it? No, um, no, I want, uh, let's see, sorry, there's lagging, my computer's trying to think too much, ah, oh, I know what the problem was, I was streaming back the, the stream the whole time, that's not a good idea, alright, here we go. Let me see if I can find, find, no, here, 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 no, here, 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 excellent. Here it is. Is that it? 
please be it. Come on. Sorry, everyone. It's not especially thrilling uh, watching me. Here it is. Dig through files on my computer. <clears throat> but maybe it'll be worth it. So, it's thinking. It's thinking. It's opening. So, you might think. Uh, oh, even better. If I go into here, you know, what are these co cycles like? <laughs> Well, oh, that's slightly giant. Here is a picture of, well, it's almost a co cycle. So you can think of white as being zero and black being one, and this is a function into zero, one. So that is my A, right? And uh, the sort of vertical axis and the horizontal axis are like it's g times g. So these are like the two axes. And this so this gives me a function from g times g to a. And so actually, I tell you a slight lie. This is not the whole thing. So two lies. One, this is not the whole of the co cycle. The whole co cycle is uh, absolutely giant. Um, uh, it's like 16 million squares or something. I can't remember off the top of my head. This is, this is a specific finite group and a, you know, a specific, and it's not actually a co cycle, it's a twisted co cycle, but eh, whatever. Um, but these things are, are like totally real. Yeah, yeah. So I put this, this is a summer research project I did with a student and it's going to be published in the next like couple of weeks. Um, so if you look at, come on, wake up you. So I talked about the quaternion groups, uh, quaternion group earlier. Um, and like it sits in a central extension. Oh, I'll get rid of this one. Oh, wow. Everything's super laggy. <coughs> just uh, go out as we came in with a computer not able to cope with regular processes okay I didn't open up the full thing it's like a giant PNG file um, patience runs a little thin let me just poke this on the screen might be able to see this. <clears throat> so this is a function from C2 times C2. Oh, there it is. This is a function from C2 times C2 to 0, 1, which is isomorphic to white, comma, black. And this is the alpha corresponds to uh, Z mod 2 to Q8 to C2 times C2 and like what C2 times C2 has four elements and so there's four squares here here's a square here's a square here's a square here's a square so there's a vertical uh, four squares vertically four squares horizontally um, and this is a co-cycle so there's an actual explicit one you can write down um, or you can go and like do a project and calculate some code and get a giant one um, I really wonder where the big one is now uh, I'll have to put it in discord because uh, my computer probably will not cope um, trying to f open up the big one Let's see. No, I don't know where it is. It's somewhere. And it's related to the... Uh, uh, the co two co-cycle. So it's 
it's one of these things, right? So g squared to a is a two cocycle. I say cocycle because I really just mean two cocycle. Um, delta two alpha equals zero. So elements in cohomology are generally called cocycles. <coughs> um, and now I really, really want to know where that big one went. Yeah. Anyway, so so the big, the real example, the the one that I couldn't open is like, uh, there's a subspace sitting inside um, Z mod two to twenty four. It's called the Golay code extended. Called the extended Golay code. Um, it's abstractly isomorphic to like C2 to the power 12. Um, <clears throat> yeah, and so we have this giant uh, giant function, which is, um, what is it? So there's like 2 to the 12 times 2 to the 12. Yeah, so it's a, it's a, uh, it's a 4096 by 4096 matrix. With zero one entries um, <clears throat> yeah yeah Tommy we'll, we'll have a look at that uh, tomorrow anyway so I had this giant 4096 by 4096 matrix which was encoded as an image with uh, zero was white and one is black um, and we did some computations it was sweet as um, yeah that's just... so anyway I I think we can uh, we're, we're, we're reaching the point of uh, decreasing returns um, and uh, I can waffle more about this fun example uh, to anyone who wants to listen elsewhere um, but otherwise um, I would, I'm marking the, the, the assignments will be out uh, this afternoon and um, yeah we'll do some do some a little bit of stuff tomorrow the cut products I think tomorrow um, I do encourage everyone to get to the the two if you possibly can. Um, more the merrier. Anyway, I hope you've enjoyed yourselves to for some extent and for a given definition of enjoyment. And I will see you all anon tomorrow. There's uh, a Zoom thing, so I'll make sure that the, the link is available in the usual spots. All right, cool. Catch you later. Have a good one.